This is how the Prowler opens, with a shock of aberrant behavior that it forces the audience to parse together and become complicit in by way of the first-person perspective. Interestingly, in earlier film noir, 1947's Dark Passage with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, not only utilizes a first-person perspective to great effect, but was the second ever film to use such POV. Although, that's a movie to discuss once we get to the major film noir canon. For now, we'll be focusing on an entry in the minor, 1951's The Prowler. It's impossible to talk about The Prowler without also talking about the restoration process undergone to make this hidden film noir gem available. Because it was an independent production, there was no major studio looking to preserve the original film and it was left orphaned, so to speak. It got to a point where the only known copy available was a 35mm print that was screened at the 2000 Festival of Film Noir at Hollywood's Egyptian Theatre. That copy would eventually begin to deteriorate, leading to the restoration effort. Spearheaded by TCM's own Eddie Muller and his Film Noir Foundation, a pair of names you'll become familiar with, in partnership with the UCLA Film and Television Archive, they were able to acquire enough elements and the restoration was created in 2008. However, prior to the 2009 DVD and 2015 Blu-ray restorations, the movie was dangerously close to becoming lost media. It's through these combined efforts of the UCLA Film and Television Archive and Muller's Film Noir Foundation that we're able to enjoy this film today. So I just wanted to take the chance to say thank you to the people that worked on this. If you get the opportunity to grab the DVD or Blu-ray, the included featurettes and making of documentary are well worth it, as is the audio commentary from Muller. Originally titled The Cost of Living, the original screenplay was written by then-blacklisted screenwriter Dalton Trumbo. One of the Hollywood Ten, the first ten members of the Hollywood Blacklist, Trumbo was cited for contempt of Congress for refusing to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee during the HUAC's investigation into alleged communist influences in the film industry. Trumbo, by this point, had also written one of the films we'll see in the major film noir canon later on, 1950's Gun Crazy. He would also go on to write Stanley Kubrick's 1960 feature, Spartacus, years later. The story had been purchased by Sam Spiegel of Horizon Pictures, who would also be blacklisted two years later, from authors Robert Thorne and Hans Wilhelm for an unknown amount. His partner at Horizon, John Huston, another name you'll become familiar with as this series goes on, thought this would be a great role for his then-estranged wife, Evelyn Keyes, who was complaining that none of her roles were challenging enough. It's at this point that Horizon Pictures pulls a bit of a Fleetwood Mac. Director Joseph Losey, who would also be blacklisted in the next couple years, was known for his self-destructive habits. Although he was considered a skillful director, he was known to burn others on the back end while moving forward onto his next project. His wife at the time, Louisa, had been hoping for a pregnancy, but years of alcoholism had rendered Losey mostly infertile. By some miracle, the couple was able to conceive, but Louisa would later miscarry, leading her into a spiral of depression. Unable to handle her grieving, Losey would start coming home less and less, instead spending his evenings with... You guessed it, Avalyn Keys. So, just to get it all straight, Joseph Losey, the director, cheated on his wife Louisa with his producer, John Houston's estranged wife. Evelyn Keys, for her part, was actually known to have treated Louisa fairly callously throughout the affair, claiming that she was, quote, dragging out her sorrow too long after the miscarriage, end quote. By the time the movie was released, Keys would divorce Houston. Taking all this into consideration, is it really any surprise that Losey would be the one to direct this picture, with its elements of lost love, adultery, pregnancy, and infertility? Working alongside Losey were set designer John Hubley, blacklisted five years later, and cinematographer Arthur Miller. This would be Miller's final film before retiring due to health complications. Hubley himself was an established animator, having done background work on Walt Disney's Snow White before being promoted to art director for Pinocchio. He would also do some directing for a Fantasia segment and some further background work on another. In 1941, he was canned by Disney after participating in the animator's strike. His primary work on The Prowler would be designing the Hacienda, the Motel, and the Ghost Town, all of which were built several weeks ahead of schedule. Because the sets were created so far in advance, Losey would spend 10 days with the cast and crew rehearsing the whole thing. Actors practiced the lines and moving around the sets while Losey and Miller worked on camera placement. The rehearsals allowed for actual shooting to only take about 20 days from start to wrap. Inspired by the stage-like presence the actors had during rehearsals, Losey and Miller opted to film using long, uninterrupted takes. This was achieved through a lightweight crane designed and built by assistant director Robert Aldrich for Miller to allow the camera to glide through the sets. You're good looking enough. What's the matter, didn't you have enough pull? I was just a little short of talent. The House Un-American Activity Committee wouldn't be the only roadblock for the Prowler, though. The crew ran into plenty of resistance from the Hayes Code as well. 
A letter from the desk of Joe Breen cites the film's unacceptability due to low moral tone and emphasis on lust over love. The production code office also argued that Key's character was not appropriately punished for her crime of adultery, prompting producer Sam Spiegel to claim that she was punished through her quote-unquote suffering, aka pregnancy. That's enough about the movie's background. What about the picture itself? Aside from the title card's jarring amount of sleaze for 1951, we're shown from the very beginning just how much of a slimeball web played by Van Heflin, really is. He saunters into Susan's home after the titular prowler is called in and makes himself all too comfortable, grabbing at a framed picture in the entryway and examining it nonchalantly. And just like that, we're off to the races as the police, particularly Webb, gaslight Susan for the remainder of the runtime. A few examples for you here. Off your footprints, Webb. Roger. Now if you will show me the window. Oh, yes, of course, right this way. Well, you been sleeping? No, just resting. I don't sleep very much at night. And that's where you saw the face, huh? No, in here. I've been lying on the bed resting and listening to the radio, and... I thought if I took a bath, I might be able to sleep better. And afterwards, just as I was putting my robe on, I looked up and there he was. Well, if I was you from now on, I'd keep the curtain closed. You ever notice in a bank, they always keep the counting room out of sight so the customers won't get tempted? I suppose you're right. I just didn't think. Oh, it's you. No footprints out here. The grass has just been cut and it'd be kind of hard to spot. Then again, maybe the lady's just imagining things. He was just as plain as your friend's face just now. What I find especially interesting about the film is the setup that's similar to Double Indemnity. Man meets woman while she's home alone. Man falls for woman. Man commits criminal act for woman, etc. What Prowler does instead, though, is use Webb as an homme fatale, as opposed to the typical noir trope of the femme fatale. See Double Indemnity's Phyllis. Similar to Double Indemnity, and most other noir, making this an unfair sticking point amongst critics is the way that things go further and further south as the runtime progresses. What makes Prowler unique in its doing so is the subversion of the American dream. From the very beginning, the movie shows that Webb is obsessed with obtaining what Susan has, the big house and the supposedly comfortable lifestyle that comes with it. When he asks his straight-laced partner what her angle is, convinced that nobody lives that way fair and square, furthering this cynical outlook on the American dream is the inherent distrust for the police in this film. There's definitely an entire video's worth of commentary to be had here on how films like this one and Shield for Murder depict crooked cops as the primary villains, even if they are the protagonists. As for the performances themselves, Van Heflin and Keyes are both great. Heflin plays up the ne'er-do-well with a badge angle well, coming off as scummy, skeezy, and perverse. His presence on screen is equally demanding of the audience's attention and revulsion. Keyes, on the other hand, manages to play Susan as something in between damsel in distress and femme fatale at different moments as the script requires. What are you looking for, cigarettes? Yeah, fresh out. You, you don't smoke, do you? No, but my husband does, only he keeps them locked up. Are you kidding? Well, no, he keeps a cart no more in there all the time. If you were a good locksmith, I could give you a pack. Hold that. Hmm? Give me a bobby pin. Does it keep everything locked up? Mostly. You too? That's a leading question. <laughs> Probably does. A mean, jealous guy like that wants his wife all to himself. I can't say I blame him, though. I'd do the same myself. There. See how silly it is to keep things locked up? Maybe, but it did delay you for a little while. Is that all he wants, just to delay things? Sometimes a little delay does the trick. She's a joy to watch, and I couldn't help but to root for her to somehow win out in the end. The Prowler, to me, is definitely deserving of its place in the minor film noir canon. I can easily award it 4 out of 5 stars and an easy recommendation, placing it just under appointment with a shadow as the second movie in this series. At the time of recording, it's available to watch through Tubi. Other, more dubious methods also exist. Before I sign off for this week, I wanted to talk about the movers and shakers for the week. Woman on the Run gained a 1,000th review, moving it into the major canon. I also watched Tight Spot with Ginger Rogers, Brian Keithan, briefly Edward G. Robinson, and added it to the minor canon. 
Next week, I'll be releasing the first video covering a movie from the major film noir canon. Until then, stay safe and watch more movies.